Hi students, welcome to HSC Biology and Module 6, Genetic Change. This is video number 19, and we're going to have a look at recombinant DNA in just a little more detail. Our learning intention for this video is for you to describe techniques and applications used in recombinant DNA technology, such as the development of transgenic organisms in agricultural and medical applications. So in order for us to do that, we want you to make sure that you can define what a transgenic organism is to be able to describe the process of recombinant DNA technology and some of the agricultural and and medical applications of transgenic organisms. So we've really talked about recombinant DNA without specifically talking about it. Uh, so much of what we've been looking at up to this point in biotechnology and applications of genetic engineering has involved some level of recombinant DNA technology. But specifically, this is a, um, I guess certainly it's a slightly older technique than um, CRISPR, for example, and it's something that we've been able to look at and refine uh, over the recent years. It's really, um, I guess, also goes by the name of genetic engineering. It's a specific technique that we have for being able to extract genes from one individual and put them into a different individual. Generally speaking, this is going to go across uh, the species, and that's why we often refer to this as transgenics. So trans is just across, so moving from uh, moving genes that we know occur in one species and putting them into the genetic uh, code of another species, that is what transgenics is all about. One of the, um, f well, the first organism that basically helped to facilitate this was uh, bacteria. And we use that because bacteria have a circle of DNA known as a plasmid. So this word here, plasmid, and that's just a ring of DNA. And we started, and it's very simple in terms of um, nothing about this is simple, I guess, um, but simple in terms of comparing it with um, all of the DNA that's wrapped in a chromosome. Uh, this is just a much smaller piece of DNA, and therefore it's a little easier for us to be able to chop it up, uh, cut it into different pieces, and to be able to splice together um, sections of DNA um, from other organisms. What we need to do is we need to use something called a restriction enzyme. And actually, as uh, time has developed and our understanding of recombinant DNA has increased, we've increased our understanding of a range of different restriction enzymes, each of which is selected to cut at a particular uh, site or a particular sequence of bases. And that means we can be much more accurate in terms of what we're doing. The principle of recombinant DNA is actually um, attempting to duplicate what viruses do when they attack a bacteria. And yes, bacteria do get viruses. What they do is the same thing they do with us, is that they try and inject um, their genetic material into the bacterium so that when the bacterium is then replicating, it's going to replicate the viral DNA uh, or RNA as well. Plasmids have protective genes against antibiotics produced by other bacteria. And we do know that um, bacteria are able to um, evolve these sorts of antibiotic protections. In fact, we know that's one of the big problems that we've had in our use of antibiotics. We've actually helped to confer antibiotic resistance on bacterial populations. So this is the overview, I guess, of what's happening with recombinant DNA. There are three essentials if you're going to look at gene manipulation, and especially in this context of recombinant DNA. We need to be able to cut and rejoin DNA. It's the restriction enzymes that help us to do this. So here's a little piece of um, a plasmid here. And what you can see is we can cut various parts of this plasmid with different types of restriction enzymes. And we don't think it's important for you to, to remember a range of sequences for these restriction enzymes. I think one of the ones that um, is, is worth trying to sort of put into your memory bank if you can um, is uh, ECO R1 ECO from E. coli. And E. coli was one of the bacteria that was chosen um, for a lot of this early research, very simple, um, compatible with humans, able to um, replicate in very short periods of time, able to uh, introduce the genes we wanted into uh, this plasmid 
of E. coli. And so that's particularly um, an interesting one. And the sequence that we have is GAATTC. So that's the sequence that this restriction enzyme ECOR1 is looking for. And it'll cut um, this plasmid every time it sees that particular sequence of bases. So that means we, when we do this process, we don't end up with one cut. We end up with a whole lot of pieces of um, DNA. And you can actually see, maybe you can just see in the uh, backdrop to this particular slide, uh, what looks like um, barcodes almost, um, which is all of these different sections of, um, or different lengths of DNA that have been cut using this restriction enzyme. Has really good applications too in um, the use, uh, in its use in forensics uh, and paternity suits, for example. So we've got a cut and we've got to know where we're cutting the DNA and rejoining that DNA uh, with ligases. So a ligase is like a glue that helps to stick these bits of DNA back together at what are called the sticky ends. And you'll see what sticky ends are in a few minutes. Once we've uh, figured out how to cut and rejoin the DNA, we need to monitor and find out where those cuts occurred. One way of doing that is with the use of a radioactive probe. So something that's actually going to be detectable. So sometimes we might try and use colors to, to identify where these pieces are. Sometimes we're able to actually introduce radioactive uh, elements into the structure. And so therefore they will kind of uh, show us through that emission of radiation where they are. And of course, uh, it's not just about cutting them and sticking them together and figuring out what's going on. We actually need to, them to be able to um, get into the host, be copied nicely by the host in large quantities and perhaps even expressed, which is something we'll talk about. One of the problems that we had with bacteria, and I guess um, the, the thing that's worth discussing when you're looking at recombinant DNA, is that bacteria is a prokaryote and um, carry it. Uh, and a lot of what we were looking at were um, human genes. So human insulin, for example, is one of the common ones that's been, that's often used as an example of recombinant DNA um, technologies, but we are eukaryotic. So what we were trying to do, what, one of the tr challenges we found was trying to introduce eukaryotic DNA into a prokaryote. And that's one of the reasons why yeast has actually become one of the go-to uh, hosts for this sort of recombinant DNA technology. Yeasts like bacteria have short uh, reproductive cycles, reproduce very quickly into large numbers in short periods of time, but yeast are eukaryotic. They're a type of fungus, and so therefore they're eukaryotic cells, and so there's a, a slightly better compatibility when we're looking at moving eukaryotic DNA into another eukaryote. This is the walkthrough, and this is something I'm not gonna spend too much time on because I think we need to go through in a class, have a look at some specific examples. The key is this. We have this plasmid, which is our circle of DNA that's sitting, for example, in our uh, E. coli bacteria. We have a particular section, a gene that comes from somewhere else. In this case, we're talking about insulin. So the insulin gene cut from a specific place where we know that this gene is expressed, a pancreatic cell, the pancreas is where insulin is, is produced. And we use a restriction enzyme. And the specific restriction enzyme is going to cut here and here. So it's gonna cut both the plasmid and the original DNA in the same sequence with this little sticky end. Now the sticky end that we've talked about before means that it's not a flat cut, it's kind of like a, a, a zigzag cut. Okay, so we find the G-A-A-T-T-C uh, sequence. G-A-A-T-T-C, that's the kind of the sequence. The cut would go kind of in that little stepped fashion between um, those that, that sort of combination of six or, th or three codons, if you like, three little triplets, uh, two little triplets there, two lots of three. So um, that, that is what produces a sticky end. So basically you end up with um, this G, C, T, T, A, A here. So this would be one end. And then the other end would this be this A, A, T, T, C and the G over here. And this would be your other end. And what you want to try and do is bring these two ends together. 
Now, of course, when you bring them together, you could actually just be reforming the original plasmid. So it could be plasmid, plasmid joining together. But there'll be a proportion of these where you'll actually get um, the, uh, the DNA that's coming from the pancreatic cell linking into the plasmid. And that's on the basis of complementary basis, complementarity of the um, uh, nitrogenous basis. And that's one of the reasons why this is such an elegant system. The whole system of DNA structure is fantastic when we're talking about uh, DNA replication. It's, it's fantastic when we're talking about protein synthesis and trans, uh, transcription and translation. And here's another example where this complementarity is just fantastic for us trying to cut little pieces from DNA from one particular organism and try and stick them together with bits of DNA from another organism. So obviously the idea is that we use ligases or we use something that's going to help to encourage these these sticky ends to stick back together. It's going to bring our foreign piece of DNA into the plasmid. And then obviously what we want to do is inject or, or in, reinsert that back into the original host cell, allow it to do its um, reproductive thing, and then we'll end up with copies of this. And if we, if we figured out how to switch this on, as I mentioned previously, then we can actually get the insulin to be produced and we can isolate, um, concentrate and extract that for human use. This is just one example of recombinant DNA and insulin. It obviously has significant uh, implications in human health and medicine, but it's certainly not the only example, and we'll have a look at a couple of those in class um, just to help extend your understanding of this area of recombinant DNA. Thanks for watching.